Hello again, and welcome back to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My name is Mike Parker, and I'm the instructor for the class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Links to the class website are available in the show notes for this video. On the website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint slide presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for these sites and the materials on them. If you enjoyed this lesson, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And subscribe if you want to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. The key individual in this lesson is Nephi, the 6th century BC leader of the people of Nephi in the land of promise in the Western Hemisphere. Outlining what we'll cover in this lesson. In his final recorded teachings, Nephi prophesied of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon to a wicked world in the last days, the opposition it would encounter, and how it would play a role in the Lord's covenant promises to Israel. Nephi then gave his final testimony concerning the doctrine of Christ. The setting for Nephi's teachings was the Nephite settlement named after him by his people. In our last lesson, we discussed Nephi's extended quotations and interpretations of the writings of the prophet Isaiah. In 2 Nephi chapter 27, Nephi reinterpreted Isaiah's prophecy of a marvelous work and a wonder to describe the coming forth of the Book of Mormon in the last days. The things which shall be written out of the book, Nephi wrote, shall be of great worth unto the children of men. In chapters 28 through 30, Nephi expanded on that prophecy and tied it to his earlier vision of the great and abominable church, recorded in 1 Nephi chapters 13 and 14. He began by describing the false churches that will be built up in the last days with their false doctrines and false teachers. These false churches, plural, will claim to follow the Lord, but will argue with each other and deny the Holy Ghost, the power of God, that is to say, priesthood authority and revelation, and miracles. Behold, they will say to the people, there is no God today. In other words, God has nothing to do with human beings anymore, or perhaps he never existed in the first place. 2 Nephi 28, verses 7 through 8, quote, Yea, and there shall be many churches which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and it shall be well with us. And there shall also be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry. Nevertheless, fear God, for he will justify in committing a little sin. Yea, lie a little. Take the advantage of one because of his words. Dig a pit for thy neighbor. There is no harm in this. And do all these things, for tomorrow we die. And if it so be that we are guilty, God will beat us with a few stripes. And at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God." Unquote. These churches will focus on seeking worldly pleasure with no consequences, or at least very few consequences. These false teachings deny or limit the requisite justice of God, the certainty of which was taught by Lehi, Jacob, and Nephi. Nephi wrote that many people shall teach after this manner false and vain and foolish doctrines. These churches will be proud and corrupt will persecute the poor and the meek, and will be wicked and immoral. They have all gone astray, save it be a few, who are the humble followers of Christ. But even they, in many instances, do err, because they are taught by the precepts of men. These churches are part of the great and abominable church, which is the kingdom of the devil. Nephi invoked three woes for those who follow these false churches, but extended the promise that if they repented, they would not be destroyed. 
The churches Nephi described are all part of that great and abominable church, the horror of all the earth, which is the kingdom of the devil, the same which Nephi had seen in a vision decades ago in the valley of Lemuel along the Red Sea. Remember that these churches aren't just religious organizations. They are all churches or organizations of whatever name or nature, whether political, philosophical, educational, economic, social, fraternal, civic, or religious, which are designed to take men on a course that leads away from God and his laws, and thus from salvation in the kingdom of God. These false churches and philosophies operate by stirring people up to anger and rage, pacifying them in their carnal or fleshly security, and flattering or pleasing, soothing them in the false belief that there is no hell until they are grasped by the awful chains, death and hell, to be judged and condemned by God. Nephi pronounced seven woes on those who are part of the false churches and the kingdom of the devil. His list of woes echoes the ten woes pronounced by his brother Jacob in 2 Nephi chapter 9. Woe number one, woe be unto him that is at ease in Zion. Woe number two, woe be unto him that crieth, all is well. These first two woes directly address those individuals mentioned in verse 21, who will have been pacified and lulled away into carnal security, that they will say, all is well in Zion, yea, Zion prospereth, all is well, and thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. I am fascinated by the word carefully in that verse. It suggests that Satan's methodology is to tempt us line upon line, precept upon precept, starting with small temptations and working up to larger ones, all the while pacifying us into thinking that what we're doing isn't that bad, or doesn't harm anyone, or is okay because we have good intentions. Nah, it'll be fine, is an easy justification to make at every step as we are led carefully down to hell. Woe number three. Woe be unto him that hearkeneth unto the precepts of men, and denieth the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Woe number four. Woe be unto him that saith, We have received, and we need no more. Woe number five. Woe unto all those who tremble and are angry because of the truth of God. Woe number six. Woe be unto him that shall say, We have received the word of God, and we need no more of the word of God, for we have enough. Numbers 4, 5, and 6 are significant problems, and not just from outside of the Church of Jesus Christ. Some Latter-day Saints cling rigidly to the beliefs and interpretations they already have and reject modern revelation from living prophets. The prophet Joseph Smith described the resistance he observed in his own day. Quote, there has been a great difficulty in getting anything into the heads of this generation. It has been like splitting hemlock knots with a corn dodger for a wedge and a pumpkin for a beetle. Allow me to pause for a moment and explain what he meant by this. A hemlock knot is formed when a branch of a hemlock tree meets the base of the tree. These knots are very tough and difficult to cut. A corn dodger is a flatbread made of cornmeal. A beetle is a heavy mallet or hammer used to drive wedges into wood to split the wood open. Joseph Smith was comparing teaching new truths to the saints to trying to split tough wooden knots by using a pumpkin to drive in a wedge made of cornbread. Continuing with the quote, even the saints are slow to understand. I have tried for a number of years to get the minds of the saints prepared to receive the things of God but we frequently see some of them, after suffering all they have for the work of God, will fly to pieces like glass as soon as anything comes that is contrary to their traditions. They cannot stand the fire at all. How many will be able to abide a celestial law and go through and receive their exaltation, I am unable to say. But many are called and few are chosen. 
unquote. Closer to our own time, then Elder Spencer W. Kimball warned in 1959, quote, they who garnish the sepulchres of the dead prophets begin now by stoning the living ones. They return to the pronouncements of the dead leaders and interpret them to be incompatible with present programs. They convince themselves that there are discrepancies between the practices of the deceased and the leaders of the present. They allege love for the gospel and the church, but charge that leaders are a little off the beam. Next, they say that while the gospel and the church are divine, the leaders are fallen. Up to this time, it may be a passive thing, but now it becomes an active resistance, and frequently the blooming apostate begins to air his views and to crusade. He now begins to expect persecution and adopts a martyr complex, and when finally excommunication comes, he associates himself with other apostates." Unquote. Nephi commented on this in an interlude between his sixth and seventh woes. Second Nephi 28, verses 30 and 31, quote, For behold, thus saith the Lord God, I will give unto the children of men line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, and blessed are those who hearken unto my precepts and lend an ear unto my counsel, for they shall learn wisdom. For unto him that receiveth I will give more, and from them that shall say, We have enough. From them shall be taken away even that which they have. Cursed is he that putteth his trust in man, or maketh flesh his arm, or shall hearken unto the precepts of men, save their precepts shall be given by the power of the Holy Ghost." Unquote. Nephi will have more to say about his interlude and woes 4, 5, and 6 in the next chapter, when he'll apply them to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Woe number 7. Woe be unto the Gentiles, who will deny God despite his warnings. Nevertheless, the Lord promised to be merciful to the Gentiles if they would repent and come unto him. Nephi's ten woes led up to his prophecy of what would happen when the Lord's marvelous work would be revealed in a world seduced by the teachings of the great and abominable church. Through Nephi, the Lord reminded us of his marvelous work, the sacred record that would sound as a whistle call, it would hiss forth unto the ends of the earth to gather his people Israel. But the Gentiles to whom the record would be given will reject it, for they will say they already have a book of scripture, the Bible, and don't need another one. The Lord chastised them, calling them fools, for they wouldn't even hearken unto the Bible they have, and they will despise the Jews who gave it to them. The Bible and the Book of Mormon will stand together as two witnesses that will become one. Furthermore, the Lord commands many people to write his words, and the world will be judged according to all that he has caused to be written. Through this, the Lord's covenant promises to gather his people will be fulfilled. Nephi's prophecy in this section alludes to the law of witnesses found in the law given to Moses, which established that the testimony of one man was not sufficient to condemn a person charged with a crime. The testimonies of two or three witnesses were required to obtain a just conviction. Similarly, the testimony of two or more books will stand as evidence at the Lord's Day of Judgment. No one, except those individuals who received no law, will be left without excuse. Apostle Neil A. Maxwell wrote, quote, These records that are yet to come forth will focus, as do all the others, on the centrality of Christ, his atonement and resurrection, and God's unfolding purposes for man. Believers in and students of the Book of Mormon regard such correlative relationships between ancient and modern scriptures as being just what they are, the lattice work of the Lord, revelations coming from the same divine source. To such people, it is no surprise, therefore, to see such multiple interweavings and such abundant cross-support among the various books of Scripture. These correlated interweavings should give pause even to near-believers and disbelievers, as well as those for whom any explanation of the origins of the Book of Mormon will do, except the real one." Unquote. Nephi next spoke to his beloved brethren. 
He told them that the coming forth of the Book of Mormon will usher in the fulfillment of the gathering of Israel and the start of Christ's millennial reign. Nephi warned his people that they shouldn't think that they were more righteous than the Gentiles and were therefore destined to receive special blessings. Rather, he taught, anyone, Jew or Gentile, who repents is part of the Lord's covenant people, and anyone, Jew or Gentile, who does not repent will be cast off. He prophesied that the Gentiles who receive the Book of Mormon in the last days will take it to the remnant of our seed, the native peoples of the Americas, who are the descendants of Lehi. These peoples shall be restored unto the knowledge of their fathers, and also to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and become a pure and delightsome people. After this, the Jews will also begin to believe in Christ, and will begin to be gathered, and then the Lord God shall commence his work among all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, to bring about the restoration of his people upon the earth. In the early 1960s, church leaders began to recognize that this prophecy was starting to be fulfilled. In April 1963 General Conference, Elder Marion G. Romney of the Quorum of the Twelve noted that he had been supervising the missions in Latin America and taught, quote, All who have seeing eyes and understanding hearts may rest assured that the fulfillment of the promises to the Lamanites is at hand. Today, the church has an operation in lands inhabited, at least in part, by the remnant of the Lamanites, that is to say Latin America, 21 missions. Others are being organized. In these missions, missionaries brought into the church 22,909 people in 1962. This is well above the average of other foreign missions of the church. So you see, my brothers and sisters, the Lord is pouring out his spirit upon the Lamanites. They are accepting the record of their fathers and are coming to a knowledge of the things referred to by Jesus. It is true that they are poor, they are downtrodden, they are in large part uneducated, but they are now accepting the gospel and they will continue to accept it in ever increasing numbers. As they receive and live it, they are certain to regain their favored status in the house of Israel and participate in the redemption of Zion and the building of the new Jerusalem here in America. Jacob, even now, flourishes in the wilderness, and shortly the Lamanites shall blossom as the rose, heralding the great day of the Lord." Unquote. Since that time, 60 years ago, the gospel has flourished in Latin America. At the end of 2022, there were 6,816,000 members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the countries of Latin America, a figure that has surpassed church membership in the United States, which was 6,804,000. There are also 46 temples in operation in Latin America, with 44 announced or under construction. The Lord's gospel is going forth in great power among the remnant of the Lamanites in fulfillment of Nephi's prophecy in 2 Nephi chapter 30, verses 3 through 6. Nephi next quoted Isaiah's prophecy of the Messianic age, when God's perfect justice will be executed, there will be peace on the earth, and the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Nephi concluded his prophecy of the last days by proclaiming that, when the Messiah comes in power, all things, both good and evil, will be revealed and made known, and Satan shall have power over the hearts of the children of men no more. The last three chapters of Second Nephi contain Nephi's farewell address. Nephi wrote that he was going to speak concerning the doctrine of Christ, and he promised to do so with plainness, for the Lord God speaketh unto men according to their language, unto their understanding. He began by teaching about baptism. In his vision at the Valley of Lemuel, Nephi had seen a prophet who would prepare the way before and baptize the Messiah. He now spoke again about that prophet who would be John the Baptist. 2 Nephi 31 verses 5 through 7 and 13 through 14. Quote, and now, if the Lamb of God, he being holy, should have need to be baptized by water to fulfill all righteousness, oh then, how much more need have we, being unholy, 
to be baptized, yea, even by water. And now I would ask of you, my beloved brethren, wherein the Lamb of God did fulfill all righteousness in being baptized by water? Know ye not that he was holy? But notwithstanding he being holy, he showeth unto the children of men that, according to the flesh, he humbleth himself before the Father, and witnesseth unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping his commandments. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I know that if ye shall follow the Son with full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy and no deception before God, but with real intent, repenting of your sins, witnessing unto the Father that ye are willing to take upon you the name of Christ by baptism, yea, by following your Lord and your Savior down into the water according to his word, behold, then shall ye receive the Holy Ghost. Yea, then cometh the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost. And then ye can speak with the tongue of angels and shout praises unto the Holy One of Israel. But behold, my beloved brethren, thus came the voice of the Son unto me, saying, After ye have repented of your sins and witnessed unto the Father that ye are willing to keep my commandments by the baptism of water and have received the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost and can speak with a new tongue, yea, even with the tongue of angels, and after this should deny me, it would have been better for you that ye had not known me." Unquote. Nephi explained that Jesus Christ didn't need repentance or baptism, but he would submit to the Father's requirement to be baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness and thus provide an example for the rest of us to follow. If we intend to follow the Son, we must also submit to baptism under the following if, then, but conditions. If ye shall follow the Son with full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy and no deception before God, but with real intent, repenting of your sins, witnessing unto the Father that ye are willing to take upon you the name of Christ by baptism, yea, by following your Lord and your Savior down into the water, according to his word. Nephi also taught in verses 10 and 14 that we must be willing to keep the commandments of the Father. Behold, then shall ye receive the Holy Ghost. Yea, then cometh the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost. And then can ye speak with the tongue of angels and shout praises unto the Holy One of Israel. But, the voice of the Son told him, once you have done all these things, and after this should deny me, it would have been better for you that ye had not known me. This passage is an excellent example of how the Lord administers covenants. The conditions for entrance into the covenant are set forth, followed by the promised blessings if one is faithful to the covenant. And finally, the penalties for violating the covenant. Nephi next explained that after entering into the covenant by baptism, we must endure to the end. Nephi had heard the Father's voice proclaiming that he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. And if we do not endure to the end in following the example of the Son of the living God, we cannot be saved. He then taught in 2 Nephi 31, verses 17 through 20, quote, Wherefore, do the things which I have told you I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. For, for this cause have they been shown unto me, that ye might know the gate by which ye should enter. For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism by water, and then cometh a remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. And then are ye in this straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. Yea, ye have entered in by the gate, Ye have done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son, and ye have received the Holy Ghost, which witnesses of the Father and the Son unto the fulfilling of the promise which he hath made, that if ye entered in by the way ye should receive. And now, my beloved brethren, after ye have gotten into this straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done? Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for ye have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, 
relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Unquote. Verse 20 appears to be a deliberate allusion by Nephi to his father's vision of the tree of life. In Lehi's dream, the rod of iron represented the word of God, and the fruit of the tree represented eternal life. There are striking parallels between Nephi's account of Lehi's tree of life vision and Nephi's exhortation in 2 Nephi 31. These parallels suggest that his final teachings were based, at least in part, on the life-changing truths he learned from his father's vision. The vision of the tree of life was the first great doctrinal teaching in Nephi's record. Now, at the end of his life, he had come full circle and coupled his final testimony to the symbolism in his father's vision. Nephi testified that baptism and enduring to the end are the way, and there is none other way nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ and the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. Nephi's brethren who heard him teach pondered somewhat in their hearts concerning that which they should do after they had entered in by the way. Nephi gave them three specific commandments on how to endure to the end. Commandment number one, he reminded them how he had taught after ye had received the Holy Ghost, ye could speak with the tongue of angels. Since angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, they speak the words of Christ. Therefore he commanded them, feast upon the words of Christ. For behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what you should do. Commandment number two, enter in by the way and receive the Holy Ghost. It will show unto you all things what ye should do. Nephi had given his people the doctrine of Christ, which would stand as their law until Christ himself would come and replace the law of Moses with his higher law. Until then, Nephi was prevented from saying more because of unbelief, wickedness, and ignorance. Commandment number three, hearken unto the Spirit and pray always and not faint. That is to say, give up hope and stop praying. What should we pray for? that the Father will consecrate thy performance unto thee, that thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. Nephi's teaching is that we should always pray before carrying out anything done for or in the name of the Lord, so that what we do may be made holy and benefit us spiritually. Nephi concluded his record with his testimony. He apologized that his writing wasn't comprehensive or as mighty as was his speaking. For when a man speaketh by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto the hearts of the children of men. But behold, there are many that harden their hearts against the Holy Spirit, that it hath no place in them. He nevertheless believed that what he had written was of great worth, and especially unto his people. He prayed fervently for his people, and he knew that the Lord God will consecrate my prayers for the gain of my people. The things he had written would teach his people and persuade them to believe, to endure to the end, and to speak out against sin. Nephi then listed the personal characteristics that were of the greatest importance to him and restated the doctrine of Christ that he taught in chapter 31. Second Nephi 33, verses six through nine, quote, I glory in plainness, I glory in truth, I glory in my Jesus, for he hath redeemed my soul from hell. I have charity for my people, and great faith in Christ, that I shall meet many souls spotless at his judgment seat. I have charity for the Jew, 
I say Jew because I mean them from whence I came. I also have charity for the Gentiles. But behold, for none of these can I hope, except they shall be reconciled unto Christ, and enter into the narrow gate, and walk in the straight path which leads to life, and continue in the path until the end of the day of probation." Unquote. Nephi had charity, Christ-like everlasting love, for his people, for Jews, and for Gentiles. But he explained that all people must be reconciled unto Christ and walk the straight and narrow path for the remainder of their lives if they expect to be spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. In Nephi's concluding statement, he affirmed the reality of God's final judgment of all mankind. The English text of the Book of Mormon calls this scene a bar, which conjures up a courtroom-like setting where a defendant stands before a barrier between himself and the judge and pleads his case. 2 Nephi 33, verses 10 through 15, quote, And now, my beloved brethren, and also Jew, and all ye ends of the earth, hearken unto these words, and believe in Christ. And if ye believe not in these words, believe in Christ. And if ye shall believe in Christ, ye will believe in these words, for they are the words of Christ, and he hath given them unto me, and they teach all men that they should do good. And if they are not the words of Christ, judge ye, for Christ will show unto you with power and great glory that they are his words at the last day. And you and I shall stand face to face before his bar, and ye shall know that I have been commanded of him to write these things, notwithstanding my weakness. And I pray the Father in the name of Christ that many of us, if not all, may be saved in his kingdom at that great and last day. And now, my beloved brethren, all those who are of the house of Israel, and all ye ends of the earth, I speak unto you as the voice of one crying from the dust. Farewell until that great day shall come. And you that will not partake of the goodness of God, and respect the words of the Jews, and also my words, and the words which shall proceed forth out of the mouth of the Lamb of God, behold, I bid you an everlasting farewell, for these words shall condemn you at the last day. For what I seal on earth shall be brought against you at the judgment bar, for thus hath the Lord commanded me, and I must obey. Amen. Unquote. Nephi, Jacob, and Moroni all concluded their teachings by promising to meet those who heard their words at the great day of God's judgment. At that day we will know, if we do not know already, that Nephi truly taught the doctrine of Christ and the only and true doctrine of the Father, and that following it is the only way we can be saved at that last day. That concludes our lesson and our study of the book of 2 Nephi. In our next lesson, we'll begin our study of the book of Jacob by reading Jacob's teachings to his people on pride, sexual immorality, and the Lord's covenant relationship with Israel. The reading for the next lesson is Jacob chapters 1 through 4. See you then.